Tonight's presentation is titled, How Hot is Too Hot? Hmm. Our presenter, Mike Bush. Mike is president of Savvy Aviation. He's an author for numerous aviation publications and a very long time contributor to the EAA webinar series by doing a first Wednesday of the month webinar. Mike holds a certified flight instructor certificate, a A&P mechanic certificate with uh, IA privileges, aviation maintenance technician of the year in 2008, and a member of EAA. Mike, thank you so much for being with us tonight. I'm gonna turn control the presentation over to you. Well, thanks, Tim, uh, and good evening, everybody. Um, second here. I should hopefully be able to see my screen. Um, hey, Tim, is it getting cold yet up there? Oh, gosh, yeah. <laughs> it's in the 30s now. It's, <laughs> oh, it's kind of a winter jacket weather here. It's getting Oh, obnoxious. goodness gracious. It's, it's only started, too. <laughs> thanks for asking. Uh, yeah, you should, I hope your weather's nice out there in California. You should come visit us in California. It's it's still light here. I bet it's dark there. Anyway, um, so uh, wanted to talk a little bit about uh, cylinder head temperature. Um, get a lot of questions about that, um, and uh, uh, you know, basically there. And I've often said that that there are two keys to um, uh, making a piston aircraft engine last a long time. One is to fly it regularly and, uh, and avoid extended periods of disuse. Um, and the other is to manage uh, cylinder head temperature um, properly. Uh, if, if engines don't like to sit, and uh, probably the biggest uh, reason that uh, piston aircraft engines uh, fail to make TBO and start making metal, is because of corrosion related things, particularly with the cam and lifter interface. Um, this upper picture here shows a cam that's starting to come apart and this engine doesn't have very much more time left before it's gonna have to get torn down. We don't like to see that happen. Uh, so the best way to prevent it from happening is to, is to fly the aircraft regularly and keep a, 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 a good oil film covering all of these various metal parts so that they don't corrode. Um, but uh, tonight we're gonna focus on the on the second one, which is managing cylinder head temperature. Um, that's an interesting picture of a, a head to barrel separation in a continental engine. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. Now, wh why are we so focused on cylinder head temperature? Um, you know, in a perfect world, we wouldn't be in a perfect world we would have a gauge in the cockpit um, that displayed uh, a peak combustion chamber uh, pressure so that we could actually see what was going on in, inside the combustion chambers when the engine is running and in fact when when, when we set a piston engine up on a test stand down at uh, george brawley's uh, ma magnificent test stand down there in ada oklahoma um, that's exactly what they do. They, they install uh, some tricked out uh, Champion spark plugs in the, uh, in the uh, top spark plug position of each cylinder. And those tricked out spark plugs have pressure sensors built into them. And those go into a big computer system. And we actually get to watch on computer screens exactly the instantaneous pressure curves that are going on inside of the cylinder. And that tells us a tremendous amount uh, about the health of the of the combustion, how much stress there is on the various components, and whether we're getting uh, close to an area where detonation would be a threat. Um, so it would be absolutely fabulous if we had this information in the cockpit when we were flying, but but unfortunately, it's not practical to do that. Uh, talk to George about that. Um, those tricked out spark plugs could could never get certified. The sensors are extremely expensive and they don't last very long. And um, so it's just not practical to in instrument our engines uh, that way in 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 the airplanes the, the way that they do when they're running them on a test stand. So in the absence of being able to see that, cylinder head temperature is the best available proxy that we have for inter internal cylinder pressure. And it, and it turns out that um, 
there's a pretty close relationship between cylinder head temperature and internal cylinder pressure. So uh, CHT is easy to measure, ICP is not easy to measure. So we have to uh, settle for CHT in the cockpit. Now it's not a perfect proxy and we'll talk about uh, some of the adjustments that we have to make uh, in interpreting CHT, but but it's it's the best one we have. So we, we need to really be focused on um, on cylinder head temperature. And if we want to protect our engines against excessive uh, internal cylinder pressure and, uh, and and cutting down our detonation margin, we we need to make sure that we watch CHTs closely and, and limit them to a reasonable value. So of course that brings up the, the question, well, what is a reasonable CHT? Um, and you know, the other, other day I got an email from a, from an owner of a uh, an RV, uh, I think it was an RV seven A, I'm not sure, but at any rate, uh, he he was complaining to me. He said, you know, I've got this RV. It's powered by a Lycoming IO three sixty engine. And no matter what I do, I can't keep the CHTs below 370 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and uh, was looking for advice on how to do that. Um, so I explained to him that, that that was not really a realistic target, that, that that there was no good reason to be limiting CHTs on a Lycoming IO360 to 370 degrees. And in fact, that was probably a little bit lower than he really wanted to run. Um, I'm not sure, you know, where he got the idea that that limiting his CHTs to 370 degrees was a good thing, but it 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 was an unreasonably low target, and uh, it was no wonder that that he wasn't able to uh, uh, to keep them that low. Um, as a general rule of thumb, uh, I personally like to see cylinder head temperatures kept to no higher than about 400 degrees Fahrenheit for Continental engines, and about 420 degrees for Lycomings. Uh, if you can do that, if you can keep the CHTs below uh, the, one of those two um, targets, um, you're guaranteed to avoid excessive uh, stresses that, that, that will be detrimental to the longevity of the engine. And you'll be guaranteed uh, that 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 you are very very far away from uh, from any threat of, of detonation. Now it's interesting that the difference between Continentals and Lycomings. So uh, you know my company maintains a gigantic database of engine monitor data, biggest in the world. We have something like three and a half million flights of piston powered GA airplanes in our database. And so, you know, we've done a bunch of interesting studies, and one of the studies we did a while ago was to, to, to compare the cylinder head temperatures of actual Continental engines and actual Lycoming engines. And you can sort of see from these, from, from these uh, uh, graphs on the right that, that Lycomings do tend to run about 20 degrees hotter than Continentals. There's some good reasons for that. Um, mostly having to do with the fact that the Lycoming engines use sodium filled exhaust valves, which do a, a better job of transferring heat from the valve to the cylinder head. So we see that reflected in, in higher cylinder head temperatures. And it, it's not anything to worry about because Lycoming cylinders are, are built to take the additional heat. They have a more robust head to barrel junction with a, a, a wider friction band for any of you wonks who are into how head to barrel junctions work. And um, it's also, this is reflected in the fact that Lycoming's uh, official factory red line is much higher than Continental's. Uh, most most uh, Lycoming engines uh, have a, a factory CHT red line of 500 degrees Fahrenheit. And most Continental's have a factory red line of 460 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and that that is kind of appropriate because the Lycoming cylinders are are, are built to be able to take um, um, higher heat. But both of these CHT red lines, 460 for Continental, 500 for Lycomings, those are ridiculously high temperatures. They should be treated as emergency values. Uh, we never want to let our CHTs get anywhere near that high. 
because we, we, we risk bad things happening if we do. Um, I'll never forget, we had a, a client a few years ago uh, who was flying a Cirrus over Florida. I forget exactly where it was, but um, he, he was flying along in the Cirrus um, and all the Cirruses are very, very well instrumented. Um, he wasn't really paying attention to his cylinder head temperatures and one of the cylinders uh, started to run hotter than the others. And the CHT gradually increased um, over a period of about 15 minutes. So we, we reviewed the engine monitor data very carefully and, and, and it majestically climbed and it got it got above 380 and it got above 400 and it got above 420 and it got above 440. And it finally got to the red line of 460 and he still never noticed it. And this all happened quite slowly. It got to 466 and, and the head separated catastrophically. And he made an emergency landing, uh, a successful emergency landing on a, you know, with a five cylinder engine that was shaking pretty badly. And he probably, change his underwear. But um, uh, at any rate, it, I mean, that, that registered with me that we have to take these red lines extremely seriously, that, that, that those red lines represent a temperature where, where, where the cylinder may, may just come apart. And whenever we uh, run into a case where we can document cylinder head temperatures that have, have gotten above the factory red line, we always recommend changing the cylinder because we're, we really can't be confident that the head to barrel junction wasn't compromised and that the heat treat of the cylinder head wasn't compromised when with the temperature that hot. So we don't want to be anywhere close to those factory red lines. Um, now, I tend to like to leave myself a little cushion above those, you know, below those, those uh, numbers that I gave you earlier. So I fly a continental powered airplane and I try to keep my CHTs right around 380 degrees Fahrenheit if I can, which is about 20 degrees below the 400 degree uh, the kind of self-imposed limit that I was talking about earlier. And for light combings, uh, around 400 degrees is a really good cylinder head temperature um, to, to shoot for. Um, they're not, these are not, not to exceed values, they're they're just nice, comfortable, um, sweet spot numbers. Um, so that RV uh, owner that I was talking about earlier, who was trying to keep his light combing at 370, wasn't really doing himself any favors. The, the, there was would be no problem with him running the cylinder head temperatures around 400 degrees or even 410 degrees. Um, that, that those are just comfortable values for Lycoming. Um, so if you look at a like a factory cylinder head temperature gauge, um, it probably looks something like this. It's it's got it's got a, a green arc that goes all the way up to the factory red line, which as we've already discussed is kind of ridiculously hot. This one is depicted for Continental with a 460 degree, 60 degree red line, um, and that's not really the mental picture that that I think you should have. So if I were to remark this gauge, and I, I, I do remark it kind of in my imagination, um, it looks something like this, uh, where, where, where I set a kind of a self-imposed red line around 400 degrees and say, I don't, I don't wanna go higher than that. And then I'll set a green arc that tops out at about 380 and say, well, that's that's really the sweet spot. And if it starts getting above 380, I may start trying to do something about it. And if it gets above 400, I'm going to do something about it pretty aggressively. You know, for a light combing engine, it would look something like this. The, the official red line's up at 500. I would set a kind of a self-imposed imaginary red line around 420 and a green arc that, that, that goes up to about 400 degrees. And now, you know, there's nothing magic about these numbers. They're, they're just they're, they're just suggestions. Um, you know, modify them as you as you see fit. And actually, there's some good reasons you might want to modify them. 
um, for example, if if you're flying um, in unusually cold outside air temperatures, uh, below standard temperature, then you probably want to subtract 20 degrees from all those numbers uh, because if you're flying in very cold air, um, the cylinder head temperature, the normal cylinder head temperature at a particular internal cylinder pressure is going to be lower simply because there's there's colder air going over the, the the cooling fins. So you might want to modify those numbers downward a little bit when you're flying in very cold air. And similarly, if you're flying an airplane that has an exceptionally efficient cooling system, some of the modern design airplanes like the, the, the Cirrus uh, or, or Columbia or Diamond aircraft have very, very efficient cooling systems. Um, you, you may want to lower those numbers a little bit. The, the, the numbers I was quoting are kind of more for average or legacy aircraft with you know, sort of mediocre run-of-the-mill cooling systems. And conversely, you may want to adjust those numbers a little bit higher if you're breaking in a new cylinder, because we know that freshly honed cylinders tend to run hot until the breaking is complete. So, you know, for breaking in continental engines, I normally recommend running as much power as you can without exceeding about 420 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and with Lycomings, I would say say 440 would be a reasonable limit for, for breaking in a new cylinder. Those those things are, are going to run hot. Um, now, I don't want you to get the impression that CAT is one of these things where, you know, uh, cooler is better and much cooler is much better because we really don't want the cylinder head temperatures to get too cool. Uh, the risk of running very low cylinder head temperatures is that um, when our combustion temperatures get down low enough, the lead scavenging agent in the in the 100 low lead fuel uh, called ethylene dibromide can't really do its job properly of scavenging lead, which means taking the 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 the, the lead from the tetraethyl lead octane a booster that's that's blended in with a gas and and turning it into a gas that will pass harmly out the exhaust rather than condensing as uh, as solids on you know spark plugs and and exhaust valves and so on these lead deposits are particularly um, problematic uh, in Lycoming engines because they're the primary cause of, of uh, a valve sticking that tends to be a problem with Lycomings. Again, more Lycomings in Continentals because of the Lycomings uh, sodium-filled exhaust valves. It makes them more vulnerable to, to getting um, lead uh, deposits built up on the valve stems. Uh, I think it's actually lead bromide. Uh, and causing the valve not to move smoothly in the guide, and uh, eventually that can cause serious problems if it's not if it's not remedied in time. So we 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 don't want the CHTs to be too hot. We don't want them to be too cool. Um, so you know, for that reason, I would also suggest that that when you're doing your imaginary markings on your CHT gauge in your in your mind that the green arc should only extend down to something like maybe 350 degrees for Lycomings or 330 degrees for Continentals with a yellow arc below. That, that, that will keep you uh, in, in a good place. Um, so here, here's kind of the, the imaginary markings for, for a Continental engine with a, a sweet spot there right in the, the, the 350 to 380 range. Uh, and similarly for Lycoming. Again, I'm not suggesting you go out and start painting up your gauges. Um, but on the other hand, if you have a digital engine monitor where you can set uh, alarms, it's a really good idea to, to do that. I, I've got a JPI monitor in my Cessna 310, and, and I set it to alarm anytime a cylinder head temperature gets above 400 degrees. And it, and it does alarm occasionally, and when it does, I, I, I take corrective action uh, immediately to bring it, bring it back down. 
but engine monitors with alarms is uh, are a great thing because we typically don't spend a lot of time scanning the gauges visually. So it's really nice to have uh, an alarm go off that says, hey, there, you know, take a look at this and do something about it. Um, again, I want to stress that there's nothing magic about any of these numbers I've, I've given you. They're just kind of uh, good ballpark targets. Uh, if, if, you know, if, if your CHT gets above the personal yellow arc or above the personal red line, nothing's going to fly apart or anything. These are just suggestions of where a good place to try to, to be for maximum engine longevity. Um, and they're just suggestions in terms of maximum engine longevity. They're not emergency kinds of things the way the factory red line is. So let, let's suppose you, you, you are having a problem keeping your cylinder head temperatures um, down to where, where you'd like them to be. So let's talk about what, what, what you can do uh, to, to resolve that. Um, and of course, what you need to do is, is diagnose why the cylinder is running hot. And there are three primary reasons, the most common reasons uh, for cylinders to run excessively hot cylinder head temperatures. Uh, one has to do with the mixture being too lean in that cylinder. Another being not enough cooling air passing over the cooling fins of the cylinder. And the third has to do with ignition timing being, being too advanced. So, you know, the, the first step is to figure out which of these three are the cause of your high cylinder head temperatures. So let's talk about how you, how you figure that out. Um, uh, we can determine whether the problem is a mixture related problem very, very easily. Um, and a mixture related problem in an injected engine could be caused by say a partially clogged fuel nozzle. that's not letting as much fuel go into one cylinder as the others. Uh, in a carbureted engine, it could, it could be an induction leak of some sort. And we, we see those pretty commonly uh, as being a problem. But um, a high cylinder head temperature caused by a too lean mixture in in uh, in one cylinder, it's a very easy thing to diagnose because all you need to do is do a quick test flight where where you first set the engine up to cruise with a richer peak mixture, and then note down what the CHTs are, and then switch to a leaner peak mixture and note down what the CHTs are. If a cylinder is running too lean for some reason, um, then its cylinder head temperature is going to be higher than normal when it's running rich at peak, but it's going to be lower than normal when it's running lean at peak. So when we have a cylinder, say, with a, a with a partially clogged injector or something like that, and we do this this test flight where we we start with a rich at peak mixture and move to a lean at peak mixture and then go back to a rich at peak mixture again, we'll we'll see the cylinder head temperatures. Uh, change rank, if you will, where a cylinder that's the hottest uh, when Richard Peak becomes the coolest when Lena Peak. And that's kind of a dead giveaway that, that it's a, a mixture related problem. And, and we, we know what to do if it's a, you know, it's an injected engine. One of the first things we'll do is, is clean the fuel nozzles, make, make sure that, that, that that's not what's causing the problem. And if that doesn't fix it, we'll go look further. Um, on the other hand, if your hot cylinder runs hot both rich at peak and lean at peak, uh, then it's 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 not a mixture problem. It's probably a cooling air problem, because if if the cylinder is not getting enough cooling air, then it's going to run hot all the time, uh, regardless of what the mixture is. Um, so if it's a cooling air problem, it's generally a problem with the with the the baffles or the flexible baffle seals that are responsible for making sure that the cooling air uh, all passes over the, the, the cylinder cooling fins and none of it gets to escape uh, some, uh, some other way. And one of the things that's very frequently missed, um, it, it, you can go over the baffles and baffle seals and they can all look really, really good. But what a lot of people forget is that there are inner cylinder baffles that are kind of weird shaped pieces of metal 
that are mounted below and between uh, the adjacent pair of cylinders. And they're kind of down where you can't see them unless you're looking really hard. Um, you either have to be looking up from the bottom of the engine to see them, or you need to be standing on a ladder looking straight down be between the cylinders. Um, and it's quite common that those inner cylinder baffles are are, are mispositioned or misinstalled and, and are, are letting air uh, escape uh, without going through the, uh, the the cooling fins. One of the tricks that I always suggest using is to put a, a strong light um, beneath the, the engine in the bottom of the cowling and then stand up on a ladder and look down between the, the pairs of cylinders you shouldn't be able to see any light coming up through from the bottom. If if you can, that means that, there, that, that the inner cylinder baffles are not positioned properly because if light can come up, then air can go, can go down. And the purpose of these inner cylinder baffles is to prevent air from going down in the, essentially in the slots between the, the, the cylinders and, and force the air to, to go through the cooling fins instead. So that's a, that's a common problem that we see uh, with high cylinder head temperatures. That, then there's one more thing which has to do with ignition timing. Now, if the ignition timing is 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 too advanced, then all of the cylinders will be running hot, not just one or two of them. So if that's the symptom that you're seeing, and we see this particularly when airplanes come out of maintenance, so they'll, they'll go in for an annual inspection, they'll come out, and and the the, the aircraft owner will notice that the cylinder head temperatures are running hotter than they than he's used to, and if he is paying attention, he'll also notice that the exhaust gas temperatures are running lower than he's used to, and that's always the, the key that the that the ignition timing was was set too advanced, um, and, and that, that's the advanced ignition timing is is very very tough on the engine, so it's a pretty serious problem. Um, ignition timing um, needs to be set very, very accurately. Uh, the, 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 the documented tolerance is plus zero degrees and minus one degree from the timing specification that's on the engine data plate. Um, and a, a lot of mechanics use one of these flower pot uh, things with a with a pendulum and a pointer and a and a scale like that red thing in the upper picture. Um, and with a flower pot, you you can't you can't get within a, a degree. It's very easy to get several degrees off. They're they're not very accurate and very hard to read. And there's parallax problems. And if the if the little pivot that the pointer is pivoting on isn't isn't um, perfectly smooth, you you can get all sorts of errors. So. We always recommend using a digital inclinometer, which is something you can buy at Home Depot for about 20 bucks. And it's accurate to a tenth of a degree and it reads out digitally. Here's a closer picture of the two. And we, we always want to time using a digital inclinometer, um, which is very accurate, uh, rather than one of these old flower pot uh, timing indicators, which will only get you kind of in the ballpark. Um, now, when talking about timing, there, there's there's an interesting thing that happened with with timing because the 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 more advanced the timing, the 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 higher the cylinder pressures are going to be, and the the hotter the cylinder head temperatures are going to run. Uh, most Lycoming engines are are timed at 25 degrees before top dead center, um, which is a very aggressive uh, setting. Uh, Continentals typically are timed at 22. Uh, if they're turbocharged, uh, they're timed at 20. But Lycoming times their engines, at, for the most part, at 25 degrees before top dead center, which is a quite far advanced and quite an aggressive setting. And that applies to basically almost all the the, the 320, 360, 540 series of, of Lycomings. Um, now, in, in 1976, Lycoming issued a very interesting service bulletin. It's called Service Instruction 1325A. Um, and it authorized for 
many IO 360s. Uh, Lycoming had been having a devil of a problem with IO 360s running very high CHTs and winding up with a lot of warranty claims on on cylinders that that were going bad and so on. And so they they issued this service bulletin authorizing a timing change for a lot of the uh, IO 360 engines, not all of them, but but most of them that were being built up till that time uh, in 1976. And they authorized to, a timing change uh, to change the timing from 25 degrees, which is very aggressive, to 20 degrees, which is very conservative. It's a huge change, five degrees in, in, in timing. Um, and, and this applied to the IO360 um, A, C, and D families of engines and the aerobatic uh, versions of those engines. Um, and here's, here's what the service bulletin looked like. Um, now, it's just, it was only a service bulletin. Uh, it, it wasn't ever an AD or anything like that. And Lycoming started changing the timing on the, the, the those engines that they shipped from the factory uh, to 20 degrees. But uh, because it was a, a service bulletin and not an AD, what we wound up with is, is a mixture of engines in the field, IO 360s, some of which are timed to, to 25 degrees and some of which are timed to 20 degrees. Um, and you know, if you if, if if you carried out the service instruction, uh, one of the thing, one of the parts of the service instruction had to do with remarking the data plate, which 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 always indicates what the 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 proper ignition timing is, and and marking the the new timing on the data plate. So when we look at our at our uh, our database, which I kind of showed you before, that there's this interesting phenomenon that when you look at the at the graph of the Lycoming cylinder head temperatures, it's got this funny double peaked formation uh, compared with the continentals, which look kind of like a normal bell curve. And the reason for the double peaks is that, that we've got this mixed population of IO 360s out there, some of which are timed to 25 and they run considerably hotter, and some of which are timed to 20 and they run considerably cooler. So, at any rate, uh, all this kind of leads up to um, my suggestion that if you have an airplane powered by a, an IO360 that's one of the engines that is eligible for the SI1325A uh, timing change to go from 25 to 20, uh, and you are having problems with, with high cylinder head temperatures, which frequently you will be, then I would suggest that you, you you go ahead and comply with the service bullet and then reduce your timing to, to 20 degrees and it will have a pretty dramatic effect on bringing down cylinder head temperatures. If you're flying a, a Lycoming powered uh, experimental that, that, that has any kind of Lycoming in it that's timed to 25 degrees, because it's experimental, you're allowed to time the engine anything you want. So I would suggest that if you have uh, CHTs that are higher than you're comfortable with, that you experiment with reducing the ignition timing, not necessarily all the way back to 20, but but maybe try, you know, 23 or 22 or something like that, um, which is considerably more conservative and will will reduce the cylinder head temperatures um, considerably uh, without uh, any kind of really significant uh, uh, reduction in in performance. And if you're flying a Lycoming powered certified aircraft, uh, which is not eligible for the for the service instruction, uh, you know I can't suggest that you experiment with your ignition timing because it's a cert certified airplane and you're supposed to do it by the book. But you know what I would suggest is that that since there's this plus zero minus one degree tolerance on ignition timing that you at least try to set your ignition timing to the to the bottom of the tolerance band to something closer to 24 degrees than 25 degrees. Certainly not anything higher than 25 degrees, uh, because the 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 more you retard the ignition, uh, you know, within the acceptable range, the the, the cooler that the uh, the cylinders are going to run. 
So that's just my suggestion with regard to uh, to Lycoming engine. And and Tim, that's really all I have in terms of prepared material. But I'd sure be happy to open it up for some Q and A. Okay, Mike. Thank you so much. Excellent presentation. Uh, Michael was wondering about how much power would you lose uh, percentage-wise going from 25 degree to 20 degree before top dead center? Probably not a noticeable amount. I mean, the, the, the fact that Lycoming was able to make that huge reduction from 25 to 20 um, without having to change any of the specs on the engine and you know with the, the, these engines are flying around in certified airplanes that 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 have you know minimum performance specs and so on it it, it the, i mean they determined that it really wouldn't make a, a, a noticeable difference in in performance and would certainly not reduce the uh engine power to to anything less than what you know the what the engine specs called for M most aircraft engines if you put them on a dynamometer will, will produce a, a little bit more horsepower than what the what the spec says um and and there i mean in in theory there's a, there's a tiny amount of reduction in horsepower by retarding the timing but it's probably not anything that you'd ever notice um so I, I I wouldn't be concerned about. It. And again, if you're flying an EAB, you can you can experiment with it. You can put it wherever it, it whatever feels like the best compromise. Peter was wondering if you could comment on thermocouple location on the engines at Lycoming. Is there a location that is better or runs hotter versus colder? Well, I mean, that's actually a very interesting question. Um, the, when I when I quote cylinder head temperatures in terms of these guidelines and so on, my, my assumption is that that there that cylinder head temperature is being measured where the manufacturer intended it to be measured, which is in the threaded uh, well. That's at the that that that's uh, the threaded boss that is machined into the bottom of the cylinder head uh, that, that is designed to accept um, a cylinder head temperature probe. Um, now, I, you know, I, I see some installations where instead of instead of measuring cylinder head temperature there, uh, it's it's measured with a spark plug gasket probe. And uh, the spark plug gasket probe will measure a, a rather different temperature and what it measures depends on whether it's the top spark plug or the bottom spark plug. We we, we tend to see if, if you are measuring CHT with a spark plug gasket probe on the bottom spark plug, um, it will tend to run considerably hotter than, than a standard, than a probe in the standard location and, and by considerably up to something like 40 degrees hotter. It's, it, it can be quite a big difference. And if you mount it on the up on the top spark plug, it'll tend to run cooler than where the standard probe location is. So if you're measuring CHT at a, at a non-standard location, um, then you need to make a, you know a corresponding adjustments to the various numbers that, uh, that I've been throwing out here in the presentation. Now there, there are some engines like the the, the Continental 0200-0300, which is a, sort of a, a very early design, and they're, they're basically second cousins to the to the C series engines. Um, those cylinders uh, typically don't have a threaded boss uh, machined into them, and if you have an engine like that, then you really don't have any choice but to to measure it with a spark plug gasket probe because there's no other place to measure it. But the majority of, of Lycoming and Continental engines um, do have a, a threaded boss in the bottom of the cylinder that's designed to accept a, a CHT probe. And that's the, uh, that's the location that, that, that's the basis of you know, the various numbers that I've been talking about. Several people have asked this question, similar to what Edward's question is, and that is, the CHTs that you're talking about, are they for takeoff or cruise? 
there for her all the time. Now, um, the, most people that have high CHT problems um, th th find that they're the worst uh, during climb. Um, which is not surprising because when, when you're climbing, you've got, you know, a lower, you're operating at relatively high power and, you, and you've got a lower flow of cooling air going over the, the cooling fins. Um, but I mean, the numbers that, that I was talking about are applicable, I mean, at all times in terms of what the, what, what your maximum target should be, what your minimum target should be in terms of CHT. Now, you know, the sweet spot was relatively wide and you'd sort of expect to have maybe somewhat higher CHTs in the climb and lower CHTs in descent and so on. But, um, but, but m my imaginary gauge markings were intended to apply to all phases of flight. Red just wondering, um, will changing the timing from say 25 to 20 degrees change any starting methods? Uh, well, yeah. If, if if you comply with the with the that service bulletin um, and and the the um, the Lycoming service bulletin has this very very large change from 25 to 20, which is kind of a huge change of timing. Uh, one of the thing one of the parts of the service bulletin is to uh, change um, the impulse uh, coupling uh, to one with a with a different lag uh, to to account for the, the 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 change in timing to to make sure that the the spark during starting is is in the appropriate place, which is probably just slightly after top dead center is where it's supposed to the spark's supposed to be while you're cranking the engine. And it also says something about, um, I think, engines that that use a, a a retard breaker mag, a shower of spark system, that 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 has to be adjusted differently again to provide a, a, a different a different lag time for starting. But that's all up in the service bulletin. If you're just if you're just tweaking the 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 timing a couple of degrees you know bringing it down to 24 23 or something you probably don't have to worry about that but if you take if you're bringing a, a full five degrees which is a gigantic uh, change uh, then they do want you to, to change some things having to do with the ignition timing during starting depending on whether you're using an impulse coupling or whether you're using a, a retard breaker magneto and also i'm pretty sure that that service instruction excludes uh, any of the engines that use the the dual mags, the the D D two thousand D three thousand family of dual mags, and I'm not sure why they excluded them, but it probably has something to do with with starting. Several people have wondered about aftermarket cylinders. Dennis is wondering, um, would ECI cylinder temperature limits be similar to Continental, Continental or like home in um, Titan, Superior? Well, it, it, you know, the, if, if you're talking about PMA cylinders for Continentals, then you use the Continental numbers. And if you're using PMA cylinders for Lycomings, use Lycoming numbers. The, PMA cylinders are, are basically, uh, I don't know what the right word is, replicas of, of, of the factory cylinders. They're certified on a direct replacement basis. And the, 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 the way like, you know, Superior, when they want to build one of those cylinders, they buy a Continental or Lycoming factory cylinder and they chop it all apart and, into pieces and they take a whole bunch of measurements with a very expensive uh, laser mapping tool in order to be able to duplicate precisely um, all the aspects of, of of that cylinder construction. So the you know the the head to barrel junction design and so on is going to be the same. If it's a if it's a ECI Titan cylinder for a Continental engine, it's going to have a head to barrel junction that looks pretty much exactly like a Continental factory cylinder because they're basically duplicate. They they basically duplicated. They reverse engineer it. 
Fred was wondering, uh, in the case of the Cirrus you described, would the pilot have been able to prevent the cylinder separation by increasing the fuel mixture? Oh, probably without a doubt. If he if he if he'd just been paying attention and noticed, he had a lot of time because this isn't something that happened suddenly. Like I mentioned, it was the CHT was gradually rising over a period of ten or fifteen minutes, and and he had an alarm set. You know, if he, for, for example, you know, I, I recommend having a, an alarm go off when it gets above four hundred degrees for Continental, and 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 had he taken corrective action, yeah, he definitely would have been able to av avoid that uh, head to barrel separation. No, no doubt about it. I'm sort Fred of glad. He, I'm sort of glad he didn't because it made a very interesting case study. But <laughs> if it it, it 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 was a real head scratcher that that this was going on so long and he never he never noticed it. Apparently he wasn't looking at, at the engine monitor page on his multifunction display or something. And must have not had any alarm set. Fred was wondering what effect does flying at altitudes above seven thousand feet MSL have on CHTs? Well, it it I mean it um, that's that's a little bit hard to answer because th there are a couple of factors at work, and the, the the factors tend to offset one another. When you fly at higher altitudes, um, certainly if the engine is normally aspirated, it's 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 generating less power at higher altitudes, which would tend to make CHTs lower. But at the same time, when you fly at higher altitudes, the air is less dense. And so it 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 is less effective at carrying away um, uh, the heat. And I fly a you know a turbocharged airplane where where I can maintain power up into the low flight levels. And I, I know that I have my most serious challenges in keeping cylinders cooled when I'm flying up at you know flight level one nine zero. Um, even even though the air is very very cold out there. The problem is there aren't a whole lot of molecules of it, and uh, so it doesn't do a, a, a great job of carrying away the heat. So, um, if it's a turbocharged airplane, the the cooling is going to be more difficult the higher you go. If it's a normally aspirated airplane, it's kind of a mixed bag because the you're, you're running lower power at higher altitudes, which would help, and you're also you also have less dense cooling air, which which would hurt. So the two kind of tend to offset one another. Donald was wondering, several people asked a similar question. If I'm running unleaded MOGAS or the new unleaded AVGAS with STCs, are lower CHTs still an issue? Yeah, probably not. I mean, we don't have a lot of experience with it, but yeah, the, pro the primary problem with the lower CHTs was the lead scavenging problem. And if you're running un unleaded fuel, then you don't have to worry about that. And as I said many times on many of these webinars um the 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 quicker we can get the lead out of our fuel the better as far as i'm concerned because it it causes all sorts of of, of issues and uh if if you have an engine that is eligible for uh un unleaded fuel um whether it's mo gas or whether it's g100 ul um i i would certainly opt for it uh it's it's it, it, our engines are going to be a lot healthier when we when we don't have lead in our fuel. Bart asks, you mentioned that running the engine at elevated CHTs decreases engine longevity. What exactly wears faster and how do you observe these reduction of longevity? Well, I mean there's 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 a bunch of, of factors involved. Um, high CHTs have have two quite separate effects one of them just has to do with the temperature itself uh when we when we heat up uh, uh, an aluminum alloy cylinder head it it loses strength and it loses strength pretty rapidly when we start to get up above 400 degrees um so it's more susceptible to developing cracks 
um, which is, you know, one of the reasons that we wind up having to retire cylinders is because uh, because cylinder heads crack. Um, and if it gets high enough, it will, you know, close to factory redline, it can compromise the integrity of the head to barrel junction. And I, I could I could almost do a whole webinar on head to barrel junctions because it's a very interesting subject. But the our, our, our cylinders have steel barrels that are mated with aluminum cylinder heads. And the way they go together is that they, they have a junction that it is a little bit more complicated than most people appreciate. It, it has a threaded portion where the, there are male threads on the barrel and female threads in the cylinder head and the two get screwed together. But uh, it also has a smooth portion that isn't threaded which is, is called the friction band. And when the cylinders are assembled at the factory, the, the, um, the barrel goes into a refrigerator and the cylinder head goes into an oven. And then the hot cylinder head and the cold barrel are, are basically mated together, screwed together. And then when the temperatures equalize, you, you get an interference fit. Um, and the, the strength of that, head to barrel junction is is really supposed to be in the friction band uh, because if, if if the if the 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 forces of combustion were uh, being absorbed by the threads in the head to barrel junction the 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 junction would fail pretty quickly uh, because each of those threads is a stress riser um, so it's really important that that the that the stress uh, on that junction be absorbed by the smooth friction band and not not by the threads. The threads are, are just help put the thing together, but that's not where the strength is supposed to be. Well, the more you heat up a, 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 a cylinder head, the, the looser the friction band gets. And eventually if it gets hot enough, the friction band starts to slip and the and the stress winds up being transferred to the threads. And so when we have a head to barrel separation, it almost always uh, is, a, is a fatigue fracture that initiates at the first thread in the head, head to barrel junction because that's, that's the stress riser. So I think I've gone on too long on this subject. <laughs> with, with, I should really do it with a bunch of graphics and stuff. It's kind of interesting. But at mm -hmm. any rate, uh, the, 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 the integrity of head to barrel junction depends on temperature and the hotter the cylinder gets, the weaker the head to barrel junction becomes. And if you get it hot enough, you, you run the risk of it of it failing and, and creating a separation, kind of like the, the the picture that I that I had near the opening of the webinar. Blair wonders about how long running in the red will cause a cylinder issue. Well, that's very hard to say, but I can tell you on this series it was for very long. It 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 you know, like I say, it got to 466, probably within a less than a minute after it hit 460, and and it uh, and it came apart. Now that that I'm I'm not saying all cylinders would would do that. That that was was probably you know kind of a one time occurrence, but it it left a lasting impression on me because it didn't get very much past redline before it failed. Mm -hmm. Philip's wondering, several people are kind of wondering, how do you feel about electronic ignition systems for the aircraft engines? And uh, would that have any effect on the cylinder head temperature? Uh, um, you, 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 you cut off, your audio cut off for a second, Tim. Um, but I know you were asking about uh, EISs. Um, we've had pretty good experience with, with EISs. Um, our and our, our clients, a lot of them have, you, have installed either the Surefly or the ElectroAir. Um, and, you know, we had a few kind of infant mortality problems with some of the early ones that, 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 that the manufacturers fixed, but, but nowadays we, we have pretty good luck with them. Um, the, the EISs typically offer the ability to to vary mag timing based on manifold pressure, uh, where when you when you have lower manifold pressure, they'll they'll advance the timing, and um, that 
provides you know some efficiencies um, some improvement in fuel consumption it, it also causes cylinder head temperatures to run hotter but usually when you're in the regime where the EIS is advancing the uh, ignition timing you're running at, at relatively reduced power anyway um, because you're 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 up at, at you know considerable altitude so it, for the most part we've not seen a seen a problem it, it it does increase CHT in high altitude crews somewhat but it usually isn't is much of a problem the the engines start a lot better with the EAS is that they, they they throw a much hotter spark during the start sequence and um, basically I I tend to like them and uh, I kind of wish the FAA would get to, to where they would have Prove a dual EIS installation for certified airplanes. Right now, they only allow one of the two magnetos to be replaced with an EIS. And uh, I, I wish they would get over their their fear. And and because I, I think the EISs are, are likely to be an awful lot more reliable than mechanical magnetos, um, and and allow dual uh, EIS installations. Mike William is wondering if you could uh, discuss a little bit about shock cooling of cylinders. Um, sure. Um, we used to think shock cooling was 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 a big problem uh, until we started getting really good instrumentation installed, and and then we discovered that it wasn't that much of a problem. Um, uh, first of all, we kind of have to define what we mean by shock cooling and like homing uh, has a recommendation not to cool not to let cylinder heads temperature decrease more than 60 degrees fahrenheit per minute i have a, a shock cooling alarm set on my engine monitor in my cessna 310 that that goes off when uh the cool down rate exceeds 30 degrees uh, per minute which is a pretty conservative alarm setting and it doesn't go off very often. It 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 requires a you know a fairly abrupt kind of slam dunk maneuver where you're shoving the nose down, pulling the throttles way back, in order to 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 get it to trigger. So it's it's not as much of a problem as we used to think. Uh, uh, you know, back in the old days, we, we we used to make these very small incremental power reductions of you know one inch every two minutes or something like that, and uh, that turned out to be you know, really unnecessary. And uh, so nowadays I'll happily pull the manifold pressure back by five inches and let things settle for a little while and pull it back another five inches. And by then I'm I'm at, at my approach power setting and uh, almost never trigger the cool down alarm, which I have set at a very, very conservative value. So it's, it's, it's not, it's it's not nearly as much of a problem as as we used to think. I mean, it probably one... it, may, it might be a problem like for aerobatic airplanes or or glider tow airplanes or, or, or that, that that make very very abrupt power reductions. But for for most people who fly kind of normal profiles, it's not it, it tends to not be much of a problem. Fred was wondering if the CHT reaches redline for only a couple of seconds, does that warrant a tear down and inspection of the cylinder? No, I wouldn't think so. And I, I assume he meant factory redline, not not personal redline. But um, now, if, it, if 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 you know if if it's momentary, I probably wouldn't say that it it warrants any kind of a tear down, but but it, it's we, we should try really hard not to let it get up there. Gary was wondering if you could say again what the digital uh, inclometer you use uh, for setting timing and where to buy it. Oh, I, you know, you you can get them almost anywhere. I think the one in the picture was was from Home Depot, <laughs> but you know they sell them at Home Depot and Lowe's, and I think they you could probably if you. You could probably get it at the aircraft tool uh, supply if you wanted to, but but most of the 
you know, the, the, the hardware outfits or the home uh, improvement outfits have the digital inclinometers. Uh, there, there's actually um, Aircraft Spruce, our, our sponsor, I guess I should mention them, uh, has, has a pretty nice timing kit uh, that they sell that, that has a digital inclinometer and, and, and some uh, plastic gizmo that, that makes it easy to hang it on the propeller um and it comes in a little box i i actually bought one of those and that's what i use for timing and it's a very nice setup but and, and i and i'm almost certain that that uh, aircraft spruce carries it cool uh philip was wondering what about ceramic coated cylinders and exhaust valve heads will that help to protect the cylinders and or valves by any means you know, I really don't know the answer to that. I, I've seen that some people experiment with it. Uh, it. It doesn't seem to have have really caught on with with any of the manufacturers. Um, uh, so I, I'm, you know, we, we just don't we just don't have uh, any experience with that. So I can't really I can't really offer any any comment on it. Thomas was wondering, I have a Vashon Ranger with a Continental O200. On steep climb outs, the number one CHT may climb to 410. Isn't the number one cylinder in front of the engine? And if so, why would the front cylinder get hotter than the rear cylinders? Well, because the number one cylinder is at the rear of the engine on a Continental. Continental and Lycoming uh, number their cylinders in the reverse order. Lycoming numbers them from front to back and, and continental uh, numbers them from back to front i think that's just to confuse everybody but mm -hmm. if it's a continental o200 which i i know is what the vachon ranger uses or i, I don't know if it's a continental o200 or if it's a, 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 a or if it's their copy of an o200 but at any rate the number one cylinder on that engine is the right rear cylinder hmm. John wonders, my plane does not have a CHT gauge, only an EGT. Are there any signs that might alert me that CHT is too high? Not, not from EGT. Um, EGT tells you essentially nothing about cylinder head temperature, and there are there are lots of the, the EGT is measuring something totally different. Uh, EGT is is measuring how much energy is is being wasted out the exhaust. Um, and uh, a, a lot of things cause EGT and CHT to move in the opposite direction. Um, you know, for example, as, as I mentioned, if the if the shop mistimes the mags a little too advanced, it, it'll make CHTs hot and it'll make EGTs cold. If the ignition timing is retarded, it, it does the opposite, uh, put, pushes CHTs down and brings EGTs up. So no, you, it's you. You can't use EGT to get a handle on on combustion chamber pressures or any of the stuff that we were talking about. Peter wonders generally how accurate are the thermocouples and what would be considered a margin of error on these? Well, my, I mean, my experience is that they're dead nuts accurate, and uh, you know, one one way you can you 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 can uh, get a handle on that is is that when you first power up the airplane before you start the engine uh, you know take take a look at all the CHTs and EGTs and th they should all be very very close together and very very close to outside ambient temperature because that's the temperature of you know everything in the engine before you start it and uh, generally they're very very close um, so I, I can't tell you exactly what the percentage error is, but I would guess it's quite small. Um, the thermocouple probes are quite accurate. The resistance type probes, um, they tend to have more accuracy problems, but the thermocouple probes tend to be very accurate. Major, I was just wondering why the bottom portion of cylinders does not have cooling fins? Uh, the uh, the bottom portion. Um, well, I, actually, uh, you know, the, there are, are various designs, um, and, and 
and some of them have fins that go quite far down. Some of them have fins that taper as they go down. Uh, but you know, the bottom of the cylinder is is very very well heat synced. I mean, it's bolted to a, this big giant crankcase, and it 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 has a very good heat sink. So there's not and, and plus all of the excitement is going on up at the top of the stroke. So it, it you know you really don't have is very much need for cooling down at, towards the bottom of the barrel. All the excitement is happening up near the top and at the mm-hmm. cylinder head. Frank wonders, how come when you give an engine more fuel, quote unquote, chemical energy, i.e. rich in it, the engine runs cooler? Conversely, if you lean it out, the engine heats up. Always wondered if this is all from the excess fuel absorbs heat cooling the engine? Well, um, I'm not a chemical engineer, but as I understand it, if if we start at at uh, at peak EGT, which is stoichiometric mixture, that that's the that's the the mixture ratio where the 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 amount of fuel and the amount of uh, of oxygen in the air are perfectly matched, so that there's just the the, the right amount of fuel to m- made up of the right amount of air. As you go rich of that, and you start adding excess fuel. Um, you know the the excess fuel you add can't can't combust because there there isn't anything to oxygenate it so it 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 just evaporates uh, and and the and and you get evaporative cooling uh of of the of the fuel air mixture when there's excessive fuel that's added that doesn't participate in the combustion process and um so as as you start leaning towards peak EGT, the the the, um, the, the exhaust gas temperature goes um, higher and higher, and then when you get to peak EGT and you keep leaning, uh, so that there's um, so there's not enough fuel to to compared to the amount of air. All you, at that point, what you're doing is you're reducing uh, the amount of power. Uh, once you're on the lean side of peak, uh, the the power produced by the cylinder varies basically linearly with fuel flow, kind of like a turbine engine. On the rich side of peak, varying the amount of 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 fuel makes very little difference in the in the power output, um, but makes a lot of difference in evaporative cooling. Dennis says we're installing an overhauled engine on a newly finished kit airframe. The initial ground and taxi testing will be done at low power levels, but breaking in an overhauled engine requires running hard and hot. Do you have any suggestions for how to approach this conundrum? Yeah, it is a real conundrum. It's a real problem. Um, And, you know, the, the best advice I can give you is to, if, if if it's possible, to get the overhaul shop to to do the the most extensive high power run in that they can on their test stand before they ship you the engine, because you really don't want to be doing the high power running on your on your aircraft uh, until you've gotten the you know the low speed testing done. Um, but but it is it, it's a huge problem for for EABs. They're faced with this conflict of the airframe wants them to run low power and the engine wants them to run high power, and it's 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 a, it's a it's a very difficult problem. So as I said, the best the best solution would be to to try to get the engine shop to run the engine up on their test stand for as much as possible. Not not every uh, overhaul shop even has a test stand, but you know the good the good ones do and. I mean that's one of the the advantages. If you if you buy a factory engine, those always spend about an hour on a test stand be, before they get shipped to you. Um, the worst case is when when you in, you know change cylinders in the field where you get freshly honed cylinders that you slap on the engine, and they ha- they they have zero hours on them. They've never never been run before, so you're starting absolutely from scratch. Um, but no. Uh, you know, I don't know the circumstances. I don't know if the if the engine is being overhauled or if it's if it's sitting in a crate 
in your hangar right now or what the situation is but if you can if you can get the the engine at least partially broken in on test stand before it shipped to you that would be the best the best solution to that conundrum mm -hmm. edward wonders would adding cowl flaps help with having chts just above 400 degrees well adding cowl flaps is very helpful because it lets you modulate the amount of cooling air um because you know you really would 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 like more uh, more delta p if you will the pressure differential um, in the climb and and then be able to reduce it in cruise so that you're reducing the cooling drag so I I think cal flaps are you know are a great idea very useful. Robert wonders, is there any correlation between CHT and oil temperature? Um, well, in principle, there could be some cor a correlation. The problem is that oil temperature is thermostatically controlled. And cylinder head temperature is is not thermostatically controlled unless you have a water cooled engine um so the you know the at lower cylinder head temperatures you're probably adding more less heat to the oil and under normal circumstances you would expect oil temperature to go down except that the 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 the, the vernatherm the the oil thermostat is going to try to keep the oil temperature up at at its at its set point. Normally, the vernatherm tries to keep oil temperature at something around 200 degrees Fahrenheit, and it it tries to hold it there by by varying the amount of oil flow through the oil cooler. So if the oil temperature starts to drop, it's going to start reducing the amount of oil that passes through the oil cooler, um, in in order to prevent the the, the oil temperature from cooling off. Uh, let's see. Larry was wondering, uh, will it work retarding the timing if you have one electronic mag and one regular mag? Well, I mean, sure. You, you, but you would, you, you would presumably retard them both a little bit. Um, the the mag that is most advanced is kind of the one that counts. If if, if one spark goes off before the other, the the, it's that one spark is what is what starts the combustion event. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but um, most engines are intended to have both spark plugs fire simultaneously. And uh, so, if, if you're going to be adjusting the the timing, you want to adjust the timing on on both ignition systems, and that would be true even if one of them is an EIS and the other one is a tractor mag. Dennis wonders, uh, what can be done about CHTs that are too low in cold air with a lycoming? Um, well, there's there's various kind of winterization kits that that are that are used. I'm I'm not a, an expert on cold weather flying because I live in California, but um, there are a lot of experts up, up uh, where where <laughs> Tim is hanging out. But uh, there are there are all kinds of winterization kits that that are you know kind of extra baffles that are installed during the cold weather to restrict uh, the cooling airflow, and then you take them off when the weather heat warms back up again. Tim can probably tell you more about that than I can. I've seen some people use duct tape because it's easy to put on and off when that weather changes, you know, yeah. or aluminum tape. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, David was wondering, do you like lean uh, of uh, lean of peak or rich of peak? I, I fly almost exclusively lean of peak. Obviously, not not on takeoff, but um, I sometimes climb lean of peak. I virtually always cruise lean of peak. You've done webinars on that subject, haven't you? I'm sure I have. Mm -hmm. <laughs> At least I'm sure a couple. Yeah, there's videos back in the treasure chest where you can go back and look at all that information about running Lena Peak. Yeah, I mean it's not always appropriate. Uh, and like I say, if I was if if I was 
racing at Reno, I would certainly be doing it Rich Peak. Um, but um, it, it's it you know it's particularly uh, particularly attractive when you're flying a turbocharged airplane like mine because the the, the main downside of running Lena Peak is 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 the power reduction but you know with a, a turbocharged airplane you 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 know you always have plenty of power because the engine is always thinking that it's at sea level regardless of what your actual altitude is so it's it's much less of a much less of a uh, compromise when when you're operating turbocharged than it would be when you're operating normally aspirated uh john was just wondering on an efficiently cooled engine, what's the pressure delta between the upper and lower sides of the engine? I don't remember exactly. I'd have to look that up, but I, I, I know that the delta P is very small. It's measured in inches of water, not inches of mercury, and it's 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 a quite it's a remarkably small uh, delta, which is why um, it's so important for the the, the baffles uh, seal. Um, well, because a, a little, a, a little bit of loss can make a big difference in cooling. But I can't give you the exact number of inches of water without looking it up. Paul wonders: Can another reason for excess of cylinder head temperature be a bad break-in process? Um, I'm just thinking about that. Uh, you know, probably not. Uh, the the I mean, the problem with bad break-in is is typically that the oil consumption remains quite high and never never stabilizes at an acceptably low level. But it's not. It, it doesn't tend to really be a problem with um, with cylinder head temperature because. Uh, what happens in a bad break-in is that the cylinder um, glazes, it gets this this coat of varnish uh, in, in the um, in the in the home pattern that prevents the the break-in from continuing, um, and it it results in a in a poor ring seal. But it 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 it's it would not cause the cylinder head temperature to remain elevated. Uh, let's see, just a comment here from James. He said that uh, the picture you had with the digital uh, inclometer is, is from Aircraft Spruce and it lists for uh, 209.95. Oh, that's, that, yeah, that's, that's probably the full kit with all the, the full kit yeah with that yeah, plastic it, it, holder it, it, thing on your prop and everything well and it has a buzz box in there and, a, and a, a little plastic thing you stick through the spark plug hole to establish top dead center it's got a whole bunch of goodies in there yeah that's the, i'm pretty sure that's the kit that i have mm -hmm. uh jeff says uh did i read correctly that uh mike you run wide open throttle and cruise can you talk a little bit about this and why uh, well, that is correct. Um, if, you, if you watch me fly my Cessna 310, you'll see that the throttles go full forward on takeoff and they never come back until I'm slowing the airplane down for landing. Um, and the, what, the, the reason for that, I mean, it sort of seems, seems intuitively obvious that it, it wouldn't make a lot of sense to be, you know, having a turbocharging system that's that's that's, you know, generating a whole bunch of air pressure to, to to go into the engine and 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 then have a flapper valve that that says no, I don't want I don't want all that to go in there. The engine obviously is going to run much more efficiently at wide open throttle. Um, I mean, the only reason to, to retard the throttle is is when you want less power. Well, um, when you're running Lena Peak, you, you don't regulate the power with the throttle. You regulate the power with the mixture control because when you're on the lean side of Peak, um, it's fuel flow that determines horsepower. It, it basically the engine shifts into a into a fuel fuel critical mode as opposed to an air critical mode and you control 
power with fuel, not with air. In other words, you control power much as the way you control it with a turbine engine, where it's it's it all has to do about how much fuel you put in. So, since the throttle is no longer a power control when you're running Lena P, it, it wouldn't make sense for the throttle to be anything but wide open. George was wondering if you have any data on the Rotax uh, nine series engines for uh, cylinder head temperatures. Well, we probably have a lot of data in our database because I know we have quite a, quite a lot of Rotax engines um, that that are uploading data, but I don't I don't have it at my fingertips. So, if, if you know if you have a specific question about that, and you want to email it to me. I can I can pass it off to one of my crew who who could maybe do a database inquiry and try to get some numbers for you. But I don't I don't have anything at my fingertips. All right, Mike. Well, let's wrap it up with that. Boy, we had a just a great group of questions tonight. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I saw over 1,050 people on yeah, board tonight, so just a great turnout. Mike, we're, we're, take a moment, share your closing thoughts. I noted when I unmuted my mic, we were at like 850 and headed north, so that was a very nice turnout. It's nice to nice to see that. Um, well, anyway, just you know, a few closing remarks. Uh, if you would like to get on my um, mailing list. Uh, we, we send out uh, weekly um, real-life maintenance stories of some of the more interesting things that are happening maintenance-wise to, to, to various clients of mine. And uh, we send out a monthly uh, newsletter with links to articles and webinars and stuff like that. So if you want to be on, on the list, uh, you can you can text the word SAVVY, S-A-V-V-Y, to uh, Three three seven seven seven, and uh, it will magically ask you for your email address and put you on the list. Or you can go to savvyaviation.com and click the button that says that puts you on the list. Or I think when uh, when Tim runs his uh, uh, post webinar survey that he's going to do in a couple minutes, there's a checkbox that you can check if you want to get on the mailing list. Um, my my books are still available. And all the good places to buy books in Amazon Aircraft Spruce, EAA Bookstore. Um, we have a, uh, a monthly podcast that I do with, with my colleagues, um, Paul New and Colleen Sterling, um, that comes out on the, on the first of, uh, of the month. So the, uh, the, the November episode should be available right now. And it's a, it's a call in show. It, it was sort of, patterned after the old uh, NPR car talk uh, program with uh, click and clack the Tappet brothers. Uh, so we, 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 we answer uh, uh, questions that are called in by aircraft owners and we try to have a little fun with it. So um, you can get the podcast at Spotify or Apple podcasts or wherever you like to get podcasts from. It's pretty widely disseminated. And if you're interested in participating in the, in the podcast and 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 asking uh, the uh, this our little group a question, you you can email the question to podcasts at aopa.org and they'll uh, Ian will who is our producer Ian Twombly will uh, will schedule you on, on our uh, next recording session. And finally, the uh, up next uh, three webinars in our first Wednesday of the month series uh, December be talking about propeller overhauls and how often you really need to do them. Um, in January, I'm going to talk to you about uh, a situation I had a while back with a with a bulky alternator, how I how it was troubleshot, how the problem was resolved, and there were some interesting lessons learned from that. And finally, in, in February, uh, going to be doing a webinar called Cylinder Rescue, where we're going to be talking about how many, much of the time when cylinders uh, have problems and, you know, poor compression and stuff, it's possible to remediate the problem without pulling the cylinder. And we always like to try to do that rather than remove cylinders, which is pretty invasive and has some risk associated with it. So we'll talk a little bit about about the various things we can do to to solve cylinder problems without actually having to take them off the engine. And that is all I have, Tim. 
Well, thank you very much, Mike, for just a wonderful presentation. Many nice comments here from, from attendees coming in. Thomas just says that uh, huge thank you to Mike, Tim, Aircraft Spruce, EAA, and the rest of the team for continuing to put these webinars on. I have learned more about aircraft ownership and maintenance from these webinars than from any other source by far. Thank you. That's pretty nice. Thank you, Thomas. Glad you're getting a lot out of it. It sure is fun doing it. Well, thank you so much, Mike. Great webinar. And uh, everybody who tuned in tonight, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, just a note, um, I'm out of the office tomorrow and won't be able to process the WINGS credit until Friday. So please hold on till Friday to look for your WINGS credit. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next month, everybody. See you next month, Mike. Thanks.